Abandonment to Divine Providence, Part 21 Letter 13 On Fears About Contrition To Sister Marie Therese de Villemenil You desire the impossible, my dear sister. You want to feel what is not perceptible by the senses, and to enjoy a certainty that we cannot possess during this life. True contrition, which remits sin, is, of its nature, entirely spiritual and consequently above the senses. It is true that with certain persons and on certain occasions it becomes sometimes sensible and then it is much more consoling to self-love. But it is not on that account either more efficacious or more meritorious. This tenderness of feeling does not in any way depend upon us. Neither is it by any means essential for obtaining the remission of our sins. The great number of souls truly devoted to God hardly ever experience this tenderness, and the fear inspired by them, by this deprivation, is the best proof that they are not responsible for it. The coldness they feel, far from depriving them of true repentance, is, on the contrary, one of the best penances they could offer to God. What I now say on the subject of contrition in general, I say in particular about the sovereignty of this sorrow, a quality that is usually at the one least felt. It must be asked of God, and you must wait till he produces it himself in your heart by his grace. To persist in tormenting yourself after this would be to allow yourself to fall into the devil's trap. Nothing should astonish us less than to be sometimes touched and affected, and to find, and at others to find ourselves callous and insensible to everything. This is one of the inevitable vicissitudes of the spiritual life. Fiat, fiat, resignation is the only remedy. It is certain that God always gives what is necessary to those souls who fear him. The gifts he bestows on them are not always the most apparent to the senses, nor the most agreeable, nor the most sought after, but the most necessary and solid. All the more so, usually, in being less felt and more mortifying to self-love. For that which helps us most powerfully to live to God is what best enables us to die to self. Letter 14 On General Confession to Sister Marie Antoinette de Mahouet on General Confession. My dear sister, your fears have no reasonable foundation, and you ought to reject them as dangerous temptations. When, in the course of one's life, one has made a general confession in good faith, all the ideas and anxieties that follow are so many idle scruples which the enemy makes use of to trouble the peace of the soul, to make one lose time, and to weaken and diminish one's confidence in God. Do not let us foolishly fall into this trap. Let us abandon all the past to the mer infinite mercy of God, all the future to his fatherly providence, and think only of profiting by the present. The fiat, formed in the mind by repeated acts and gradually reduced to a habitual disposition, 
leads to all that perfection which ignorant and mistaken people seek far and wide in all sorts of ways. For the rest, do not imagine that you tire me by speaking of your miseries. By dint of seeing nothing but poverty and misery in oneself, one is not surprised at finding the same in others. But if, in peace and humility, they annihilate themselves before God and ask for grace, working with His assistance to diminish their faults and to overcome themselves, they may be considered, in a way, not to have these faults. This is what Fenelon thought thought. May it sink deeply into your heart as well as this sentence which I find in the same author, and which I copied for you because I think it is exactly what will console and encourage you. We are obliged to live and to die in the deepest uncertainty, not only as to the judgments of God about us, but also to our own dispositions. We must, says St. Augustine, have nothing of our own to present to God but our own miseries. But when we have his very great mercy, which is our title to his love, through the merits of Jesus Christ. Often reflect on, the, on these beautiful sayings, in which you will find peace for your mind, abandonment, confidence, and the greatest certainty in the very midst of doubt. Letter 15 Different Fears To Sister Marie Therese de Villomenel On the same subject, Different Fears My dear sister, as neither my advice nor my efforts can deliver you from your fears about your confessions, I can see nothing for you but to resign yourself to them. Regard these troubles as a penance sent to you by your Heavenly Father, but never stop to think about them voluntarily, because I am convinced that in your general confession you mentioned everything. or at any rate, you had a sincere desire to say everything. That is enough. I do not hesitate to assure you, before God, that in this confession no omission of any importance could have been made, and therefore remain in peace about it. You are still distressed that certain sublime states that you admire in others you can neither dare to ask for, nor even to desire for yourself. Here are two remedies to alleviate your trouble, and to make you derive advantages from your weaknesses. First, to humble yourself, and to lament interiorly, but without vexation, at beholding yourself so far from such holy dispositions. Secondly, to desire interiorly to have the wish for them. This desire to desire is the first degree from which one passes gradually to a real desire, and this in its turn by dint of being renewed and of dwelling in the heart gets stronger and finally takes root. Try to recall often to your mind this great rule. God has placed me in this world only to know, love, and serve him, and could not have created me for any other purpose. Therefore I will attain this end to the best of my power. For the rest he may do with me what best pleases him. I abandon myself entirely to his holy will, which can only will my salvation and the eternal happiness in the life to come. 
It is for this only that he makes me endure so many interior and exterior afflictions. May he be blessed forever. Letter 16. Hatred of Sin. On the same subject, different fears. My dear sister, in all that forms the subject of your letter, I see no reason for alarm. You are not pleased, you say, about your want of submission and of patience during suffering. Provided that this discontent does not turn to vexation, trouble, or discouragement, it will inspire you with a sincere interior humility, a profound self-contempt which will please God better and enable you to make more progress than a patience and submission that you felt that you possessed, which would perhaps have only served to feed self-love by almost imperceptible satisfactions. You cannot yet, you say, make known to me anything else but miseries. I can well believe it, since as long as we are in this life we cannot find anything in ourselves but what is imperfect and miserable. Do you want a remedy for all these miseries? It is this. While detesting the sins that are the cause of them, love, or at least accept their consequences which are the feeling of abjection and a contempt for yourself, but do so without trouble, vexation, uneasiness, or discouragement. Remember that God, without willing sin, has made of it a very useful instrument for keeping us always in a state of abjection and self-contempt. Without this bitter remedy we would succumb to the enticements of self-love. Believe me, you must always keep cheerful, steadfast, and tranquil in the midst of your miseries, making at the same time efforts to diminish them as you advance further, you will constantly discover fresh ones. It was this clear knowledge of their own weaknesses and nothingness, which, becoming ever more distinct, increased the humility of the saints. But this humility, by God's grace, is always joyful and peaceful. It goes so far as to make them love spiritual poverty which, in this way, becomes a real treasure. Learn that under this heap of refuse, God hides the gifts he bestows on us to conceal them from the satisfactions of self-love and foolish esteem. I do not blame your tears, but I wish that while you are shedding them over your pains, you would do so before God and for his sake. In this way, instead of feeling their bitterness, you would discover in them a hidden sweetness which would tend to increase interior peace by producing an entire submission to the divine will. As for the supposed want of contrition which distresses you, you need see in it only a trap laid for you by the devil to destroy your peace. Do you not know that an apparently bitter contrition accompanied by torrents of tears is not the best, and that God by no means exacts such from you? With all these beautiful signs, true contrition may be wanting, and, on the contrary, Without any feelings of the sort, one can have the contrition that justifies. This consists in the will to hate and to avoid sin, and resides in the superior faculties of the soul, and consequently is not to be felt as it is purely spiritual. 
Remain, then, in peace, and do not attend to your self-love, which wants to feel and to enjoy this contrition, so as to be certain of possessing it. God does not desire this for several reasons, but above all to keep us always in holy humility, and in certain fear which helps towards our salvation. Enter into his designs, and when you feel no regret for your sins, humble yourself profoundly. Offer to God, in a spirit of penance, this keen dread of not possessing the requisite sorrow. Make a sacrifice of this trouble of mind to God, and to abandon yourself entirely to his mercy. He intends to lead you by way of obscurity and fear to heaven. The greatest saints themselves have no exemption from this law, but, more faithful than we, they abandon themselves entirely to God, and, by placing their whole confidence in Him, kept themselves always in peace. As for the review of conscience, that souls careful of their state are in the habit of making at least every year, one must remember that it is not an a matter of obligation, but a work of devotion and humility. Each person gives to this examination as long a time as he desires, with the advice of the confessor, and one can always be certain of saying more than is necessary. At the hour of death there is no necessity to make a general confession. One can accuse oneself of the graver sins in a general way out of compunction or in a spirit of penance, but without too much introspection. It is much better to occupy the time in making more meritorious acts of religion, of faith, hope, contrition, and love of God of resignation, abandonment, and confidence in the merits of Jesus Christ, and of union with Him. Finally, the most solid preparation for death is that which we make every day, by a regular life, a spirit of recollection, of annihilation, of abnegation, patience, charity, and union with our Lord. I do not like to find you attaching so much importance to the little comforts that are given you in your illnesses, such as getting up a little later, having your bed warmed, eating a little more at the collation. Following in all this, with the greatest simplicity, discretion, and obedience, and without thinking too much about yourself, what you feel and judge to be necessary. Provided also that the interior passions are thoroughly overcome, and that you are not wanting in patience, submission, and a total abandonment to God, in gentleness and humble forbearance with your neighbor, for these are the most essential virtues, and more satisfying than any exterior mortifications. People who are rather pious are not wanting in outward pa practices. Usually their great mistake is to make their whole sanctity consist in external works, leaving the enemy, namely self-love and the passions, alone. They make a great to-do about having eaten a few mouthfuls extra on a feast day, but will not attend to these essential things. Such piety is like that of the Jews who had a scruple about entering Pilate's house because he was a pagan, yet thought nothing of putting Jesus to death. Would to God that these deplorable illusions were never found among the religious, 
At any rate, do you, my dear sister, avoid them, and without neglecting what is external, give your principal attention to the interior. Letter 17. Remorse and Rebellion To Sister Marie and Therese de Rosen on remorse of conscience and the rebellion of the passions. Do all you can to calm your soul on the subject about which you have consulted me, first because the motives which you believe you have to make you uneasy have no foundation in fact. The only danger lies in the uneasiness itself. When the reproaches of your conscience however well merited they may be, throw you into a state of trouble and depression, when they discourage and upset you, it is certain that they come from the devil, who only fishes in troubled waters, says St. Francis of de Sales. The first care of a soul experiencing these troubles ought to be able to prevent them, to stifle them, or better still, to despise them. Let it say with St. Teresa, What my weakness finds impossible will become easy with the help of the grace of God, and this he will give me in his own good time. For the rest I desire neither perfection nor to lead a spiritual life, except so far as it would please God to give them to me and at the time he has appointed to do so. You must try to acquire a habit of making these two acts by a constant repetition of them in your heart. The second will contribute marvelously to reproduce entire abandonment, which is the special attraction of souls desiring to belong unreservedly to God. Second, the rebellion of the passions, and that excessive sensitiveness which causes one to be put out beyond measure on the slightest provocation, ought not to disquiet, nor to discourage any one suffering from them, nor to make her think that her desire of sanctification is not sincere. This mistake and the encourage discouragement it occasions are more harmful than all the other temptations. To get rid of them, or to overcome them, we must be well persuaded that these rebellions, and that these little falls, are permitted to help us to practice humility. Looked upon in this light, our falls will be very incomparably more useful to us and victory spoilt by vain self-complacency. This is a very certain and a very encouraging truth. We must be convinced, thoroughly convinced, that our miseries are the cause of all the weakness we experience, and that God, in his mercy, allows them for our good. Without them we should never be cured of a secret presumption and a proud confidence in ourselves. Never should we be able to rightly understand that all that is bad is ours, and that all that is good is from God alone. To acquire a habit of thinking thus, it is necessary to pass through a great number of personal experiences and there is a greater necessity for this the more deeply rooted these vices are, and the greater the hold they have on the soul. Third, you must never feel surprised at finding that a day of great recollection is followed by one full of dissipation, and this is the usual condition in this present life. These changes are necessary, even in spiritual things, to keep us in humility and a state of dependence on God. 
The saints themselves have passed through these alternations, and others still more troublesome. Only try not to give rise to them yourself. But should this, unfortunately, happen, then humble yourself peacefully and without vexation, which would be a worse evil than the original one. Then endeavor to regain self-control and to return to God, doing so quietly without over-eagerness, and by means of a total holy abandonment to God's ways. Fourth. Your present method of prayer is good. Continue to practice it. The humble feelings of the heart, the submissive attitude of the soul before God, are worth more than a multitude of formal acts constantly reiterated. And they are acts straight from the heart, stronger and more efficacious with God, although not always so sensibly felt, nor as clearly perceived, nor as consoling as the former. God takes us from this multiplicity to give us instead something better, more simple, and better calculated to unite us to Him. Fifth, the person of whom you speak is not wanting in the love of God. She has as much as is necessary but God has deprived her of the knowledge of it for fear that she would pride herself on it, and in order to prevent her preferring the sensible pleasure of it to him who ought to be its sole object. Let her be consoled about this, while at the same time she should always desire to love him more without wishing to know it, or to be able to be certain of it. Sixth, the opposition and perpetual contradiction between your thoughts and feelings is nothing else than that inner strife spoken of by the Apostle when he says, The spirit wars against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit. None of the saints have been exempt from this rule. It is true that this interior war is more violent with some people, and about some things more than others, and also of a certain age, or time or occasion. But whether more or less violent, no harm is done to a soul that fights with a determination never to be beaten nor discouraged. On the other hand, the greater the violence of the attacks, the more serious are the combats, and consequently the more glorious the victories. The greater the merit, the higher the sanctity, and the grander the recompense. These happy results are all the more certain the less they are felt, and especially if a more profound humiliation is experienced. Oh, if only this interior abjection were accepted, loved, and valued, no one would consent to be without it, because it brings the soul nearer to God. This great God has, in effect, declared that he draws near to those who humble themselves, and who love to be humiliated. If it is good for us to be humbled in the sight of others, it is of no less useful to be annihilated in our own eyes, in our pride and self-love, which are put an end to in this way. It is thus, in fact, that they are gradually extinguished from us. And for this purpose does God permit so many different subjects for interior humiliation. It only remains to know how to profit by them, by following the advice of St. Francis de Sales, and practicing acts of true humility, gently and peacefully. And this will drive out false humility, which is always in a state of vexation and spite. Vexation and spite under humiliation are so many acts of pride, 
just as worry and irritation during suffering are so many acts of impatience. Let us not forget this, and let us take good care not to look upon the want of feelings we experience for the things of God as callousness. It is simple, simply dryness, and a trial as inevitable and ordinary as distractions. If it is constant, it is still a better sign, because in this way that God prepares the soul to proceed by pure faith, the most sure and meritorious way. One should continually repeat to anyone in this state, peace, peace, remain in peace, and keep retired within your soul. Preserve a constant desire of the interior life. This single attraction ought to suffice to make you live within yourself and in constant communication with God. The results will follow in their own time. Guard above all against anything likely to withdraw you from this good disposition. Avoid all occasions of losing it. Humble yourself when you have failed about it but do not ever worry yourself, nor distress yourself about anything, whatever, nothing could harm you more than that. Letter 18 God alone can remove these trials. To Sister Marie Therese de Villomenel God alone can remove these trials. First, to alleviate your troubles and regrets, my dear sister, I have only two things to say to you. Everything comes from God, and, on our part, all merit consists in acquiescing to the will of God. Whether willingly or by compulsion, it will always be accomplished. Let us unite ourselves to it with all the strength of our will, and thus we shall have nothing to fear. Anguish of the heart and involuntary rebellion only augment the merit of submission. If you fear lest you do not possess this virtue, ask God to grant it to you, saying to him interiorly, Lord, I desire and will to have this entire submission, and I offer you the anguish by which I am tormented in union with the agony of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, in the garden. Second, try to avoid all useless reflections, which only embitter the heart. When, in spite of yourself, you feel irritated, Bear this trouble patiently, and when you feel impatient, then is the time to make greater efforts to have patience in enduring this impatience itself, and to resign yourself to the want of resignation. Third, read in the book of the Holy Ways of the Cross the chapters which bear upon your present state. You will find therein all the instruction, support, and consolation which you can possibly require. But do not expect to find in them what no one on earth can possibly give you. God alone can remove this trial from you. Wait his time with patience. You have always counted too much on human help. God has taken it away from you to compel you no longer to depend on anyone but Him alone, by abandoning yourself entirely to His paternal care. The more painful and violent your trial is, the more certain do I become about your salvation and perfection. You will be able to understand this later, just as I do. Fourth. As Jesus Christ crucified is our only model, and as he wishes to save us by making us all like to himself, 
He strews crosses in the path of each one of us in order to keep us in the way of salvation. If we are faithful, the reverses that cross our lives will form our riches. And see how great is the mercy of our loving Savior, after having passed through the most severe trials and accomplished the most painful sacrifices. And what is left seems hardly to count, and the heaviest crosses begin to seem quite right. Oh, happy experience, as sweet in its effects as, at first, it appeared difficult to nature. Letter 19 On Relapses To the same sister, on the same subject, and on relapses. My dear sister, the recital you have given me of your troubles, and, above all, of your faults and interior revolts, has inspired me with the most lively compassion. But, as to a remedy I really know of no other than which I have so often pointed out to you, each time you have a fresh proof of your misery to humble yourselves, to offer all to God, and to have patience. If you fall again, do not be any the more disquieted or troubled the second time than the first, but humble yourself yet more profoundly, and do not fail to offer especially to God the interior sufferings and confusion caused by the revolts and faults to which your weakness has given rise. Even if fresh occasions occur, return each time to God with equal confidence, and to endure as patiently as possible the renewed remorse of conscience and these interior trials and rebellions, and continue to act in this way. If you always do so, you must understand that you will hardly lose anything. There will be much even gained in these involuntary interior rebellions from which you are suffering. Whatever faults occur, provided you endeavor always to return to God and also to yourself in the manner I have just explained, it is impossible that you should not make great progress. Oh. How little are solid virtue and true interior abnegation known! If once for all you would learn to humble yourself sincerely for the, your least faults, and would rise directly by confidence in God with peace and sweetness, that would prove to you a good and certain remedy for the past, and a powerful help, and efficacious protection for the future. I greatly approve of your keeping away from discussions and arguments, and of your dislike of them. There certainly is, as a rule, a great amount of petty illusions and self-love about such things. For this wretched self-love, says St. Francis de Sales, mixes with everything intrudes everywhere, spoils everything. This is the effect of human misery to which we are all more or less subject. When we recognize it in others, there are two things we have to do. First, we must find excuses for those whom we notice to have been led away by it, and secondly, to fear for ourselves and watch over our own conduct that we may not, in our turn, be subjects of scandal to our neighbor. Letter 20 Depression Under Trials To the Same Sister, 1738 On Depression During Trials, Distractions, and Resentment 
first. You would be mistaken, my dear sister, to reproach yourself too much for want of resignation, because I do not consider it at all voluntary. Great afflictions are inevitably followed by a certain depression. But those souls that are faithful to God rise again quietly by their confidence and filial abandonment to divine providence. It seems, sometimes, as if it were impossible to do this, or at any rate to do it properly, but one must not be discouraged on this account. Better indeed to make of this weakness itself a subject for renewed acts of resignation to the beautiful goodness and to remain peacefully and patiently in one's own nothingness. Thus we shall fulfill the designs of God who permits us to fall into this state of depression and weakness to make us better understand and feel our misery. He wills that there should not be in us the least atom of confidence in ourselves, and that we should rely solely on His all-powerful grace. Second, I ought to tell you that for a long time past I have remarked in you a great grace to which you pay no attention. You seem to me to become ever more deeply convinced of your miseries and imperfections. Now that happens only in proportion to our nearness to God, and to the light in which we live and walk, without any consideration of our own. This divine light, as it shines more brightly, makes us see better, and feel more keenly the abyss of misery and corruption within us. And this knowledge is one of the surest signs of progress in the way of God and of the spiritual life. You ought to think more of this, not to pride yourself on it, but to be grateful for it. Nothing is more ne necessary at present but to strive to love holy abjection, poverty, and the horror of yourself which begins in this deep knowledge experienced by you. When you have attained this, you will have taken a fresh step, still more decided towards your spiritual advancement. See then how great is the goodness of God. He makes use of the sight that you have of your poverty to enrich you. This poverty becomes a treasure to those who understand, accept, and love it, because it is the will of God. This joyful acquiescence of our misery does not include, exclude, however, the, de the desire of finding a remedy for it, because if we ought to love the objection which is the result of our defects, we ought to at the same time hate the defects themselves, and to make use of the most energetic means of getting rid of them. Third, urgent occupations and the interruptions of worldly business are, in the sight of divine providence who wills and permits them, of equal value as a quiet recollection and silence. Instead of the prayer of quiet, you then make a prayer of patience, of suffering, and of resignation. But one sometimes loses patience. Well, this is the distraction of this prayer, and you must try to regain it, and to get calm with the thought that God wills or permits what upsets you and causes you pain. But above all, take great care not to lose your temper at feeling impatient, or to get worried at being upset. By humbling yourself quietly you will gain more than you have lost. Fourth, I need not enter into minute details as regards the keen pain you describe. I understand all the different distressing thoughts that fill your mind, 
and all the heartaches they cause. But here again, my dear daughter, is an excellent prayer more sanctifying than any ecstasies, if you know how to make use of it. How can you do so? In this way. 1. Often pray for the person who is the cause of your trouble. 2. Keep perfectly silent. Do not speak about it to anyone to relieve your pain. 3. Do not voluntarily think about it or turn your thoughts to other subjects that are holy and useful. 4. Watch over your heart that you may not give away in the least bit of, to bitterness, spite, complaints, or voluntary rebellion. 5. Try to speak well of the person, cost what it may, to regard her favorably, to act about her as if nothing had happened. I realize, however, that you will find it difficult in future to treat her with the same confidence without being a saint, which you are not yet. 6. But at least do not fail to render her a service when occasion arises, and to wish her all the possible good. Letter 21 On Humble Silence and Patience During Trials Take courage, my dear sister, and do not imagine that you are far from God. On the contrary, you have never been so near to him. Recall to your mind the agony of our Lord in the Garden of Olives, and you will understand that bitterness of feeling and violent anguish are not incompatible with perfect submission. They are the groanings of suffering nature and signs of the hardness of the sacrifice. To do nothing at such a time contrary to the order of God, utter no word of complaint or of distress, is indeed perfect submission which proceeds from love, and love of the purest description. Oh, if you only knew how in these circumstances to do nothing, to say nothing, to remain in humble silence full of respect, of faith, of adoration, of submission, abandonment, and sacrifice, you would have discovered the great secret of sanctifying all your sufferings, and even of lessening, lessening them considerably. You must practice this and acquire the habit of it quietly, taking great care not to give way to trouble and discouragement should you fail but at once return to complete silence with a peaceful and tranquil humility. For the rest, depend with unshaken confidence on the help of grace, which will not be refused to you. When God sends us great crosses and finds that we sincerely desire to bear them well for the love of Him, He never fails to support us invisibly and in such a way that, according to the greatness of the cross, will be the amount of resignation and interior peace, sometimes indeed even greater, so immense is the bounty of Jesus Christ, our Master, and of the spiritual graces he has merited for us. Let us conclude with this that nearly everything consists in having a good will, and to make our spiritual progress assured God will mercifully do the rest. Knowing the full extent of our weakness, misery, and incapacity for doing anything good, he sustains and fortifies us, working this good in us himself by his divine spirit. The practice of accepting at each moment the present state in which God places us can keep us in peace of mind 
and cause us to make great progress without undue eagerness. Because this, it is a very simple practice. We should adhere to it strongly, but nevertheless with an entire resignation to whatever God requires about it. A great sign that we are not deceived about our love of God is, firstly, when we desire all that pleases Him, and secondly, when we have had a great horror of sin, even the least, and strive never to commit any deliberately. Since God has given you the grace to take my favorite maxims to heart concerning submission, abandonment, and sacrifice, be assured that he will enable you to practice them, however imperfectly. But as you are so impetuous about everything, and you want to attain that one bound to the highest perfection of in these virtues, that cannot be and you must attain to them gradually, and even while committing many small faults which will serve to humble you, and to make you realize your great weakness before God. Interior rebellion in all these circumstances does not prevent submission in the higher part of the soul. Read often the 57th letter in the third book by St. Francis de Sales. The letter has always charmed me. It will make clear to you the distinction between the two wills in the soul, the exact knowledge of which is an essential point in the spiritual life. Letter 22 to bear with oneself. To Sister Marie Therese de Villomenel, on the realization of her misery and on exterior difficulties. I might say to you, my dear sister, what our Lord said to Martha. Why so much solicitude and trouble? How can you still confound as you do the care that God commands you to take about your salvation, with the uneasiness that he reproves. As you try to abandon your temporal affairs to divine providence, while taking care of the same time, not to mention God, do the same for your spiritual progress, and, without neglecting the care of it, Leave the success to God, hoping for nothing except from Him. But do not ever dwell on such diabolical thoughts as, I am always the same, always a little recollected, as dissipated, as impatient, as imperfect. All this afflicts the soul, overwhelms the heart, and casts you into darkness, distrust, and discouragement. This is what the devil desires. By this pretended humility and regret for your faults, he is delighted to deprive you of the strength of which you have need for the purpose of avoiding them in the future, and of repairing the harm they have done you. Bitterness spoils everything, and on the contrary gentleness and sweetness can cure everything. Bear with yourself, therefore, patiently. Return quietly to God. Repent tranquilly, without either exterior or interior impetuosity, but with great peace. If you act thus, you will gradually become calm, and this practice will cause you to take more progress in the ways of God than all your agitations could possibly affect. One feels a little peace and sweetness interiorly. It is a pleasure to enter into oneself, and one does so willingly, constantly, without any trouble, 
almost without reflection. Believe me, my dear sister, and place your whole confidence in God through Jesus Christ. Abandon yourself more and more entirely to Him, in all and for all, and you will find by your own experience that He will always come to your assistance when you require His help. He will become your master, your guide, your support, your protector, your invincible upholder. Then nothing will be wanting to you because, possessing God, you possess all, and to possess Him you have but to apply to Him with the greatest confidence, to have recourse to Him for everything great and small without any reserve, and to speak with Him with the greatest simplicity in this way. Lord, what shall I do on such an occasion? What shall I say? Speak, Lord, I am listening. I abandon myself entirely to you. Enlighten me, lead me, uphold me, take possession of me. I am sorry for the difficulties and worries of which you tell me, but recollect that patience and submission to God in the midst of annoyances that are permitted by His providence will enable you to make more progress than the quietest and most recollected life. The latter always tends to flatter self-love. The former, on the contrary, afflicts and crucifies it and thus makes us attain true peace of mind by union with God. When you find yourself in such utter dejection that you cannot make a single act of any virtue whatever, beware of tormenting yourself by violent efforts, but keep simply in the presence of God, in a gr great silence of utter misery, but with respect, humility, and submission, like a criminal before his judge who sentenced him to a chastisement he says well merited, and understand that the s interior silence of respect, humility, and submission are worth more and purify better than all the acts that you, uselessly, force yourself to make, and which only serve to increase the trouble of the soul. The character of the person to whom you allude is very good, I own. But while praising God for all the good gifts he has bestowed upon her, you ought not to despise the share he has given to you. On the contrary, by your submission to and respect for the designs of God, you must wish to be as He wishes you to be, without, however, neglecting to correct yourself. The greatest improvement I desire to see in you is that your mind may never get embittered for any reason whatever, and that you always treat yourself gently. Is it not true that you behave thus towards your neighbors? You are not always reproaching them bitterly and continually about your, their characters, but you try gently to induce them to reform. Do the same to yourself, and if gradually this spirit of gentleness should take root in your heart, you would soon make progress in the spiritual life without so much trouble. But if the heart is continually filled with feelings of harshness and bitterness, nothing much can be achieved and everything costs great effort. I insist greatly in this matter because it is an essential one for you, and in your place I should apply myself seriously to acquire a great interior and exterior gentleness in all things just as if there were no other virtue to practice for this will, in your case, bring all the others in its train. I appeal to your own experience about it. 
after having worked at it for some time very quietly, without the interruption of those impetuosities and hurries which drive away all sweetness and prevent you gaining the victory, you should be able to recognize the fact that in this way much more is gained without half the fatigue. Letter 23 On Past Sins To the Same Sister July the 23rd, 1733 My dear sister and very dear daughter in the Lord, may the peace of Jesus Christ be always with you. First, I have never said anything with the meeting that you impute to me, but have only written as to a poor beginner whom God is afflicting in his mercy, in order to purify her and to prepare her for union with him. The terrible ideas you have about your past director disorders are at present what you are called to and you must bear with them as long as God pleases just as one keeps to attractions that are full of sweetness this keen realization of your poverty and darkness gives me pleasure because I know it is a sure sign that divine light is increasing in you without your knowledge and is forming a sure foundation of true humility. The time will come when the sights of these miseries which now cause you horror will overwhelm you with joy and fill you with a profound and delightful peace. It is not till we have reached the bottom of the abyss of our nothingness and are firmly established there that we can, as Holy Scripture says, walk before God in justice and truth. Just as pride, which is founded on a lie, prevents God from bestowing favors on a soul that is otherwise rich in merit, so this happy condition of humiliation willingly accepted, and of annihilation truly appreciated, draws down divine graces on even the most wretched of souls. Therefore, do not desire any other condition, either during life or at the hour of death. It is in this state of voluntary annihilation that you should have taken refuge, to escape the fears that assailed you during your recent illness. Do not fail to do so if Satan ever tries to catch you in the same trap. Self-love desires to have at the last hours. Some sensible support in the collection of past good works. Let us, however, desire no other support than that given us by pure faith in the mercy of God and in the merits of Christ Jesus. From the moment that we wish to belong entirely to God, this support will be enough for us and all or else is nothing but vanity. 2. I approve, for the rest, of your interior and exterior conduct during your illness. I perceive that God, in his wisdom, hid what little good he enabled you to gain from it, because unless he had done so, a thousand vain thoughts of self-complacency would have spoiled it all. I know better than you all that took place, and I bless God for it. He supported you well in your weakness. You have only to thank him for doing so without reflecting so much as to whether everything has really been supernatural. Leave that to God. Only try to forget yourself and to think only of him. Third, what business have you to find so many excuses for your melancholy disposition? Let everyone think what he likes about it. You have only to please God and whatever he permits others to think about 
or to say about you is of no moment to you. Therefore do not indulge in reflections on the subject. All that sort of thing only serves to increase self-love and vanity. Fourth, I am charmed that you find peace where you would least expect it. It is a sign that God wills you to enjoy peace only in the accomplishment of his holy will, which is a very great grace. If I had not been able to pity you in your illness, it is because I do not look upon the sufferings of the body as real evils, since they procure so many blessings for the soul. Fifth, you are convinced that you do nothing, that you merit nothing, and thus you are sunk in your nothingness. Oh, how well off you are! Because from the moment you are convinced of your own nothingness, you become united to God who is in all. Oh, what a treasure you have found in your nothingness! It is a state you must necessarily pass through before God can fill your soul. For our souls must be emptied of all created things before they can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So that what troubles you and makes you uneasy is the very thing that ought to pacify you and fill you with a holy joy in God. Sixth, accepting everything without reserve both future and present, is one of the most perfect sacrifices we could offer to God. This habitual act alone is worth all else that you could possibly do. Therefore your best and only practice must be to adhere constantly to all the imaginable arrangements of providence, whether exterior or interior. Do nothing but this, and God will, gradually, operate all the rest in your soul. It is a most simple practice, and exactly in accordance with your attraction. Seventh. I am not much affected about the reserved manners of your companion. You must also make this sacrifice to God. She was not so much to blame as you in what put you out so much. God has permitted this to humble you by making you understand what you really are when he leaves you to your own devices. Humble yourself without vexation or worry. You know what St. Francis de Sales says about such circumstances. 8. God requires us the fulfillment of our duties, but he does not require us to find out if there has been any merit in this or not. You think too much about yourself, and under the pious pretext of advancing the ways of God you are too much occupied about yourself. Forget yourself to think only of him and abandon yourself to the devices of divine providence. And then he will lead himself onward, purifying you and safely raising you, then, when, and it pleases him, to the degree of sanctity he wills for you. We search far and wide for perfection, yet it is also within our grasp. It is to unite our will in all things to the will of God and never to follow our own inclinations. But to arrive at this we must renounce ourselves and sacrifice, if needs be, our dearest interests. This is what we have no wish to do. We want God to sanctify and make us perfect according to our own ideas and tastes. What folly! What pitiable blindness! Letter 14 The Results of Imprudence 
to the same sister on the vexatious results of imprudence. I have already told you very often, my dear sister, that nothing should trouble you, not even your faults, and certainly far less should you allow yourself to be cast down by those trying consequences of acts which are not sins, although they imply some imprudence on your part. There is hardly any trial more mortifying to self-love, and consequently hardly any more sanctifying than this. It does not cost nearly so much to accept humiliations that come to us from without that we have not had any hand in drawing upon ourselves. One can resign oneself much more easily to the confusion caused by faults, very much graver in themselves provided they do not appear outside. But one simple imprudence that entails annoying results that everyone can see. This is decidedly of all humiliations the very worst, and therefore, as a natural consequence, an excellent occasion for the mortification of self-love. Then it is what we say over and over again, the fiat of perfect abandonment. We must go even further and make an act of thanksgiving, added for this purpose, Gloria Patri, to our fiat. One single trial, accepted thus, causes a soul to make more progress than any number of acts of virtue. I hope I have made this clear to you that you will no longer distress yourself about the consequences that are likely to follow the mistakes of which you have had been the innocent cause. Remain in peace with the intention of taking what steps are necessary at a convenient time to bring about peace and a union of hearts. Then abandon to God all the success, whatever it may be. It is well to get accustomed to act in this way in all the troublesome events of this miserable life. Thus we shall enjoy peace, and shall have made merit in the sight of divine providence. Without this submission and total abandonment we can expect no rest during the course of our sad pilgrimage, thinking only of pleasing God, of satisfying God of sacrificing all to God. Let all the rest go, and keep nothing back. Provided that God dwells within you, you will never lose anything. Take good courage, and all will go well. Do not be so uneasy, nor so surprised at the rebellions of your nature. I assure you that they will be no impediment to the submission of your higher faculties, and that God only hides this submission for your own good. In the most violent attacks just try to say these few words. It is but just that a creature should be submissive to her Creator, therefore I desire and pray to become so. Read the chapter on Progress in the interior life by Father Guilore. It is an inspired chapter, and I hope you will derive great benefit from it. For God's sake, do not sadden yourself, and try to preserve peace during even the most terrible tempests. If you do all, do this, all will go well. In fact, I see nothing but good in everything that you have confided in me, but a good that would cease to be so if you saw it as plainly as I do. When a number of different thoughts enter my head which makes the least thing assume monstrous proportions, I recall to mind the advice I had given to others in similar circumstances. I abandon myself to divine providence in all things and about all things. 
when the worst comes to worst, I defy it like St. Paul, to separate me from the charity of Jesus Christ. I know that without the grace of the Divine Savior I could do nothing, but I know also that with His grace I can do all things. I beg Him, therefore, to keep me in all my temptations from all sin, from all that could displease Him. But as for the bitterness of soul, the interior crucifixion, the holy objection, and even the confusion before others, I accept them with all their consequences for as long as it pleases His Sovereign Majesty. I desire the accomplishment of His holy will, and not my own in all things, and I implore Him not to allow me either to say or to do anything that might place any obstacle to the least thing that he wills. And if, through weakness, error, or malice, I should take anything of the kind, I implore him not to allow it to succeed. I recognize the fact that his holy will is, in all things, not only holy and adorable, but infinitely salutary and beneficent towards those who are humbly submissive, at that, and that mine, on the contrary, is always either blind or ill-regulated. Therefore I subscribe to all that the Eternal Father decrees, and would do so a hundred times no matter at what cost to myself. This dear and good Father has commanded it, that is enough, and what have I to fear? From this two conclusions can be drawn. Firstly, that during these tempests and storms, often raised by trifles, I retain such a profound peace that I am surprised at it myself. Secondly, that I consider myself very fortunate to have to endure these interior tortures, temptations and trials, then I say to myself, this is worth more than all my own miserable arrangements. I feel my soul becoming stronger by this abandonment to divine providence, so much so that all my personal desires and attachments to my own will are consumed and annihilated. Letter 15. Interior Suffering. To Sister Marie Anne Therese de Rosen. Rules to follow during trials. You know as well as I do, my dear sister, that in order to raise souls to a state of perfection, God is wont to make them bear all kinds of crosses and interior pains to prove their fidelity to purify them, and to detach them from all created things. The most grievous of these crosses are those in which we may have been to blame ourselves, and where the poor soul, severely reprimanded by others, and even more severely by itself, does not hear either outwardly or inwardly anything but a sentence of death. The person whom you speak in this state, therefore, there is nothing to fear about her. All that you tell me proves, to, on the contrary, that God has particular designs with regard to her. When you write to her, speak of nothing but patience, submission to God, and total abandonment to divine providence as one does to people in the world who are afflicted with temporal necessities. Above all, try, make her try, by means of the most filial confidence in God, to repulse energetically all trouble and voluntary uneasiness. I repeat, voluntarily, because the poor souls 
to whom God sends this trial cannot master the troubles and anxieties by which they are obsessed. This is the subject of their greatest pain, and the most afflicting part of that state of humiliation in which, for a certain time, God retains them. Therefore they have nothing else to do but to submit to God about these paroxysms of interior suffering as well as a as about all the rest. Say to this poor soul that her best prayer will be to remain always in silence at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, repeating like him and with him, Fiat. O oh, Heavenly Father, may your will, not mine, be done in all things. It is you who arrange all our afflictions for the good of our souls. You would not act thus if it were for my greater good and eternal salvation. Do with me what you will. I adore and submit. I think that your friend does quite right, does quite right not to examine her thoughts. An examination of that kind would only confuse her mind still more. She must leave all to God, and despise these thoughts and the pretended cries of her conscience, and go forward without taking any notice of them. Directly there is nothing absolutely bad in the act she wishes to perform. These vain scruples are a device of the devil to deprive her of peace, and thus to prevent her making progress in virtue. The trouble is to the soul a most dangerous malady, and make it too languid for the practice of virtue, as a sick person who is weak and languid is capable of bodily exertion. If she succeeds in preserving peace of mind, she will gradually recover, just as an infirm and languid person recovers health by taking rest and good nourishment. I will give three methods by which to hasten her recovery. First, to repulse quietly from her mind all the trouble, all that troubles her and makes her anxious, looking upon this sort of thought as coming from the devil, because all that comes from God is peaceful and sweet, and helps to establish confidence in him. It is in peace that he dwells and that he infuses those different virtues that bring souls to perfection. Second, frequently to raise the mind and heart to God with acts of submission, abandonment, and confidence in his paternal goodness, which only afflicts her at present to sanctify her. Third, to choose for her reading those books most likely to contribute to calming her mind and, and, uh, and to inspiring her with confidence in God, such as The Treaty by Monsignor Languet, The Book on Christian Hope, The Letters of St. Francis de Sales. For the rest, let her go on as usual without making any change in her conduct making her confessions and communions as she is accustomed to, because the devil, to deceive her, and to weaken her still more, will very likely use every artifice to inspire her with dislike and an excessive fear of confession, of communion, and of all other spiritual exercises. She ought not to lend an ear to these evil inspirations, but always to follow the light of faith, and in the holy practices of the Christian religion, like a true and good daughter of Holy Church. Amen. Letter 26 On Different States of Resignation to Sister Marie Therese de Villemanel, on the same subject, 1733.
My dear sister, first, I cannot do otherwise than congratulate you on your efforts you are making to keep always in a state of perfect resignation and of entire abandonment to the will of God. In this, for you, consists all perfection. But on this point, as on all others, you must learn how to distinguish between the appearance and the reality, the feeling of consent and the working of the will. There are two kinds of resignation, one that can be felt and one that is accompanied by sensible pleasure and a quiet repose, the other unfelt, dry, without pleasure, even accompanied by feelings of repugnance and interior revolt. It is this latter that I understand you to possess. The first is good very agreeable to nature, and for this reason rather dangerous, because it is natural to become strongly attached to that which one enjoys. The second, which to self-love seems absolutely painful and unpleasant, is the more perfect, more meritorious, and less dangerous, since there is no pleasure to be found in it except through bare faith in perfect love. Compel yourself to act with these solid motives. When you have succeeded in doing so, your union with God will be proof against every vicissitude. But if you accustom yourself only to act according to sensible attractions, you will do nothing when these come to an end. Besides, we cannot prevent them from failing, often failing us, while the motives of faith never fail. It is only in order to induce us to act, gradually, from these spiritual motives, that God so often takes away sensible devotion and pleasure. If he were not to act thus, we should always act to remain in a state of spiritual infancy. You should not therefore be surprised at the weariness and the revolts of which you speak. God permits them for your own good. Nevertheless, if you fear that human motives are mixed with the mortifications you inflict on yourself, say these two things to you, yourself. 1. I am not at present in a fit state to judge but will reflect about it when I feel peaceful and calm. 2. If there is still some human element in it, God allows it that he may help my weakness. When it shall have pleased him to render me more or less imperfect, I shall be able to act in a more perfect manner. On this matter be calm and do not indulge in the least voluntary trouble. Second, I can easily understand how your dislike of your duty should materially add to your trials, but consider how the martyrs won their crowns by enduring much worse tribulations than yours. Third, in this state it is, un it is usual to feel an inclination for a solitary life. But a life of obedience is of greater value. It is a continual sacrifice, and even if there is more cause for being bored, there are also many subjects for meriting. Continue as you are, with great fortitude and even scruple, to utter a word against your state or that could detach you from the cross of Jesus Christ. Fourth, the best way of bearing these disagreeables is to look upon them as crosses sent by God, just as you do illness and other misfortunes of life. If God were to send you exterior afflictions that you could feel, you would bear them patiently, Bear then with equal patience your interior trials. 
Fifth, look upon all these miseries of our earthly existence as so much treasure from the spiritual life. Since they afford you such a powerful means of acquiring humility and self-contempt, with this aim in view, love every humiliation and its consequent abjection, as St. Francis de Sales counsels. You ask me if it would not be better to hide your miseries for fear of causing a disedification with all my heart. Try simply and very quietly to manage so that these feelings may not appear externally, but if they should appear, and you are not greatly to blame for it, try to accept this little humiliation pleasantly. Even should it occur by your own fault, then embrace the abjection which it brings you. In this way you will mortify your self-love very meritoriously, for this seeks to avoid outward faults, not because they are an offense against God, but on account of the humiliation they entail. Do not dwell on the pain that the difficulty you experience in concentrating your thoughts causes you. Remind yourself that the habitual desire of recollection alone will serve equally well, and that all that is necessary is to desire unceasingly to think of God, to please God, to obey God. In order to please and to obey Him in reality. You say that the more you desire to learn to pray, the less you know how to do so. This may be very possibly be, because your desire is not accompanied by a sufficient submission and purity of intention. Always have the intention of pleasing God when you pray and not of enjoying sensible devotion. Pray in a spirit of sacrifice and accept all that God pleases to send you during your prayer. And I must tell you that the prayer of recollection is one of those things that leaves you if you are eager to retain it, and remains if you learn how to keep yourself in a state of indifference about it. This is the doctrine of St. Francis de Sales. Seventh, often recall to mind this great rule, that spiritual poverty recognized, felt, and loved on account of its abjection is one of the greatest treasures that a soul can possess here below, because this feeling keeps it in a state of profound humility, but to imagine yourself lost because you do not find in yourself lively enough feelings of faith and charity and to be distressed, uneasy, or discouraged about it, it is a dangerous illusion of self-love, which always wants to see things plainly, and to take pleasure in itself. When you experience them, this temptation, you must say to yourself, I have been, I am, and I shall be whatever God pleases, but according to my reason and the higher faculties of my soul, I desire to belong to him and to serve him, no matter what happens to me in this world and the next. Eighth, you cannot describe to me what you are suffering, but I will tell you what it is. It is for one thing all kinds of rebellions, pains, and temptations in the inferior part of your nature, and a perpetual confusion of feelings excited by the devil and your own self-love. On the other hand, in the superior part, a little ray of light and of faith that is almost imperceptible on account of the tumultuous emotions in the inferior part. And with only this slender support, you are immovable, because the finest thread in the hands of God is as strong as a cable, and a mere hair is stronger than an iron chain. Ninth, it is a temptation and a false humility to keep away from the sacraments. 
What others do ought never to affect you, who know nothing about their ideas nor motives, nor the cause of their keeping away. Tenth, you say that God often deprives you of the feeling of being in a state of grace. To whom, among his dear friends, has he gi given continually this sensible support? Do you aspire by any chance to be so highly privileged that so many saints whom he has deprived of it for a much longer time than you? What had they to depend upon, then, save only the light of faith, and of a faith the same as ours, which seemed like darkness? Amidst the darkness of thy temptations and the tumult of their passions, they knew no more than we do whether God was satisfied with them. Faith teaches us that, unless by particular revelation, the saints themselves were not able to be perfectly certain about it, and you complain because you do not possess this certainty. See how far this unhappy self-love goes. To satisfy it, God would have to work miracles. Of all the miseries that humble you so much, this is certainly the greatest, and the best calculated to humiliate you. Eleventh, to wish to be occupied with God and not with yourself, and then to fall back continually on yourself, I must own, a temptation as troublesome as flies in autumn. But then you must drive away this temptation as you have continually to drive away the flies, without ever leaving off this work. Quietly, however, without distress or annoyance, humbling yourself before God as you do in other miseries, it is we, ourselves, who compel God to overwhelm us with the miseries to make us humble and to increase our self-contempt. If, in spite of this, we have so little humility and so much self-esteem, what would it be if we found ourselves free from these trials? Believe me, you have appeared to be for some time past so penetrated with the knowledge of your miseries that I believe this feeling alone is one of the greatest graces that God could bestow upon you. Love, then, everything that helps to preserve it. I remain yours in the Lord. I feel very tired of so much writing, and before reading to the end of your letter I had the same idea as you, to divide my answers. I do not, however, regret having now placed you in a condition to understand at a single glance the general drift of the direction you ought to follow in order to gather all the fruit of the trial to which God is subjecting you.